It is a very frequent question in the clinic. Simon, is there one type of Parkinson's disease or are there lots of different Parkinson's disease? And it was actually one of the areas that I started my research career around Parkinson's disease back in Cambridge was to explore this question which we in the trade call heterogeneity. That is to say, is there one Parkinson's or are there different types of Parkinson's? Well, um, I think it's fair to say that there's probably one type, but with lots of different flavours. And I equate it really to a box of chocolates. So you'll know that there are some square chocolates, some round chocolates. The way that I look at it is that some Parkinson's patients have got sweet centres and some are tough nuts. And it's very obvious um, that in actual fact there do seem to be, if you like, what we call different subgroups or clinical phenotypes. And the research that I did in Cambridge we actually replicated in Australia. And that research said, look, if we took you know, hundreds of patients with Parkinson's disease, can we divide them into subgroups based on the pattern of symptoms that they exhibit? And that work, um, interestingly enough, has been looked at around the world and some centres have actually managed to replicate those findings. And uh, it looks as though there are sort of four rough groups that we look at. And these groups would be the younger onset patient. Now these aren't young young. These are patients maybe in their 50s, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, and they tend to progress more slowly, but of course because they're young, they're more likely to run into the need for an advanced therapy, like deep brain stimulation or one of the infusion therapies. Uh, the second group, a bit older, in the 60s, is tremor dominant. This group tend to have more in the way of tremor than problems with their walking and balance. And these patients are generally a little bit better with things like cognition and also their mood. At the third group, um, if you like the opposite, is a non-tremor dominant group. So these patients have little in the way of tremor and it's important to know that about a quarter of patients have no tremor. Um, but these patients have little in the way of tremor and have more problems with balance and walking and stiffness. And they do seem to be more affected with problems of memory and thinking and also mood disturbances and potentially the hallucinatory phenomena that we see. And then the final group that shook out of the research was what we call an aggressive, a rapid progression group who just seemed to have a much faster course. Now, before you start asking yourself the question, which one of these four am I? The answer is very hard to know. And these are data across large groups. They do allow us to start asking questions. Questions like, well, should everybody have the same treatments? Um, should we be getting into this area of precision medicine? It may well be that there are things that we don't yet know that, if you like, decide which sort of pattern you are. You could imagine that if you're a younger onset patient, maybe the processes that resist the disease aren't as good. Or, alternatively, they're very good in that they say, okay, well, I'm going to get Parkinson's now, but I'm going to have a very slow progression because I know what I'm going to do with these horrible things that are going on in my brain. Of course, nobody gets to choose. But we are getting these insights, and whether it's because of genetics, or whether it's because of other factors, we're not entirely sure. But it's a very important area for our research, and I have to say that it has relied upon the research clinic that we have, with now over a thousand patients who've been kind enough to come in and give us their time and us to take the data and actually try and make some sense of it. And I'm hoping that they'll be rewarded in the long run when we come up with better therapies. But at this time, I'd just like to say thank you for being involved in that research.